Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and back with me this week we have Spike's editor Tom Slater. Hello. And Spike columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. Coming up on the show, Jimmy Carr and online safety, the heckling of Keir Starmer, the smearing of Joe Rogan and Justin Trudeau versus the truckers. So a joke by Jimmy Carr has gone viral. It went completely mad over the weekend, it's fair to say. And the response has been a lot more than the usual Twitter storm. Mm. Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries has got involved and essentially warned that her online safety bill, this government's new uh, legislation for regulating the internet, would have done something about this joke. The joke was about the Holocaust and the genocide of Roma people. Obviously, explaining that out loud kills the joke immediately. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tom, what have you made of this scandal? I have found the response quite baffling. Um, because Jimmy Carr being kind of purposely offensive is mm. nothing new. It just feels like this response to it, whilst there's always been you know a fair bit of pearl clutching whenever you've had a comedian kind of try and cross the line, make these kinds of sick jokes or whatever, it just feels like it's on another level um, than previously. I mean, I thought it was pretty well established that if you're talking about language or like anything creative or whatever, that, you know, context, yeah. intent, setting matters. And it's so obvious when you look at, this particular offending joke, that it is intended as a joke and not a joke at the expense of Roma people or mm. anyone else. I mean, Leo Curse has written about this on Spike for us this week, and he points out that the joke, again, not to sort of butcher it or necessarily even repeat it, where he kind of says, you know, people talk about the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust, they don't talk about the um, gypsies who were killed, and him saying, again, that um, they don't want to talk about the positives. So. The reason that it works, at least on its own terms, is because there's this misdirection. It almost, yeah. It's almost like he's kind of setting up the audience to make a kind of worthy point about how mm. we never talk about this or whatever. And then he comes in with something incredibly offensive. That's the reason that it works, is that kind of sharp intake of breath. And unless you were kind of of the view that this was Jimmy Carr taking an opportunity to just have a pop at Gypsies because he think it's funny, or that everyone in the room at the filming of this Netflix special were sharing in a moment of racism together because they all secretly hate these people. Unless you genuinely think that, then it's quite clear this is what it is, which it was an offensive joke in a special that was billed as his dark material and full of career ending jokes, very, being very self-consciously about how far can I push this? And yet the response has been so strange and kind of literal minded, I guess, you know, the, the various different kind of uh, foundations and kind of charity organizations, whether it's the Holocaust Memorial Trust or various groups representing Roma people and all the rest of it. I mean, you can understand why they would find this offensive because it is offensive, but saying things as has been said, like he used this as an opportunity to celebrate genocide yeah, or that he could have used this as a moment to, you know, raise awareness about this particular issue. That's not what he was doing and that's not what his job is. And yeah. I just think there's you, you know, two things can be true at the same time. Yes, it was offensive, but at the same time, it's not what it's being billed as. And it certainly shouldn't lead to him being sort of cancelled or punished, whether that's by the law or by anyone else at this <laughs> point. It's just incredible that you have to point this stuff out, I guess. It, this literal mindedness has been been particularly crazy. I mean, you've had people, um, particularly some Labour MPs, refer to it as a joke using inverted commas, as if it's not really a joke, as if the real, you know, there was a hidden meaning behind the mm. joke, there's a hidden seriousness behind the joke. Or even um, there was one Labour MP, Lucy Powell, referred to it as his comments, as if it were simply a sincere statement of his um, beliefs. I mean, the fact that these politicians are getting involved, particularly Nadine Dorries, the Culture Secretary, you know, talking about potential legal repercussions. I mean, that almost proves the point that um, MPs and government can't be trusted to uh, regulate humour, to regulate, you know, what we say and think, because they clearly don't understand it. Yeah, well, I think there's I think there's a lot of bad faith in the discussion about what's gone on with the Jimmy Carr set because as Tom says, if you just see that joke on Twitter on its own or in the newspaper, I saw it and I thought, oh, yeah, you know, mm, that is yeah. just that's too far for me. I don't, I mean, I don't laugh at Jimmy Carr's humor anyway. I don't like dead baby jokes. I don't mm. like all that kind of stuff. It's not my my cup of tea. But you then, you know, go either go watch the Netflix show or you read about what he said. And like you said, it's couched in as Simon Evans mentioned on Twitter, you know, more trigger warnings than come with, you know, box of rifles. <laughs> it's it's completely clear from the outset that what his whole aim is to make you shocked and appalled. Mm. So it, you know, that's part of the joke is that you think this is too far and yet I'm laughing. And so that completely I think it completely takes the sting out of it. I don't, I really don't believe that actually anyone 
truly thinks that what Jimmy Carr was doing was getting up on stage to try and rile up hatred against Roma and Sinti people. I just, I don't, I don't buy that anyone actually thinks that. What's really going on is that people are less worried about Jimmy Carr's intentions and more worried about the audience's mm. intentions. So the fear here is that you have a public either in that audience on Netflix or, you know, watching reruns at home who take the opportunity to have a, that of Jimmy Carr having, using Roma people as the butt of a joke um, to then kind of embolden their own prejudices against gypsies and then say, oh yeah, well, we can just be horrible to them all the time. Or yeah, the Holocaust didn't really matter in relation to those groups of people. And we know that there is a problem with, uh, uh, you know, anti-gypsy and anti-traveller prejudice. That's why partly it's so sickeningly, ironic isn't the word, but it's just it's sickening to watch Nadine Dorries and other um, conservative MPs who currently reside over policies that are, are discriminatory against travellers try and play the moral high ground um, in relation to this. But it's also, you know, it that despite those problems, there is a general sense in society that everyone knows that the Holocaust was wrong. Everyone knows that the genocide of Roman Sinti people was wrong. And people don't aren't aren't, I think, sick enough to try and link that to prejudice in the here and now. So there's a lot of bad faith going on. And there's as was always with these kind of stories and examples, it's really more about mistrust of the audience than it is actually Jimmy Carr or whoever else is in the spotlight. Let's talk a bit more about the kind of online safety dimension of this. Mm. I mean, obviously we have Nadine's comments come in a week where the government is beefing up its already massive online safety bill, saying there's going to be new offences for trolling, new offences for willingly spreading disinformation mm. and things like that. I mean, this online safety bill has a real, become a real juggernaut, hasn't it? It's almost, you know, it's quite worrying mm. the implications for free speech here. And they're sticking all kinds of different things onto it as they go, um, which is not going to make for a good piece of legislation, let alone one that from the outset is going to prove to be deeply censorious. And just, you know, the prospect of a government minister saying we would intervene to basically stop this form of comedy. I mean, mm. It's just, why that doesn't sound alarm bells for more people, I don't know. It's also quite ironic, of course, it's Nadine Dorries saying this, given that, that quote that did the rounds when she became culture secretary as a means to kind of take the piss out of her, I guess, but saying that, you know, snowflakes had ruined comedy. This yeah. is, you know, it's kind of interesting that when actually push comes to shove on free speech, a lot of these Tories will jump, whether it's sincerely or not, on a bandwagon to demonstrate how moral and wonderful people they are, especially when they've had a couple of bad weeks of press, shall we say. <laughs> but I think, I mean, Ella's point about the audience, I think is really important as well, because comedy is, is, is an interesting one, because for whatever reason, um, particularly if you're talking about comedy that goes to like a mass audience, the same sort of caveats that would be applied to theatre or or anything kind of more highbrow are just not applied. Mm. You know, there's a kind of assumption that the audience will just take this in, that it's just sort of tickling their prejudices, that they are all just idiots. And even depending on the kind of type of comedy, because the sort of stuff that um, Jimmy Carr and also Frankie Boyle before he kind of got woke would do was sort of kind of Jerry Sadowitz style extreme humour, but mm. slightly kind of tidied up and for a mass audience, if you like. So even if you have someone like Sadowitz, who's like very... Uh, famous, fated in the kind of comedy circuit, will still perform these kind of incredibly kind of you know it's full of r race jokes, you know mm. rape jokes, all this sort of stuff. But it's very fated because it's kind of in the right context. It's yeah. around you know right thinking people who couldn't possibly take the wrong message from this. But as soon as it's something that's big and on the telly and a stu and a arena tour and a Netflix special or whatever, people suddenly get much more touchy about it. It's it's just uh, there's something fascinating about this where for whatever reason it feels like the normal rules don't apply because it's that kind of audience, it's those kind of people, there's too many of them. I guess. Yeah. It's also the case that people seem to have forgotten a bit like discussions we've had about books having trigger warnings or being cancelled and things like that, that, you know, part of comedy is it's not meant to be necessarily real life. You know, there is mm. a fictional element to it. You're in, you know, a darkened room in a basement and a comedy show. There is a, there's a kind of, you're suspending reality. And, and, and Jimmy Carr is playing a fictional character. Yes. A fictionalised version of himself who believes the most and says the most crazy and insane, horrible thing. That's why they call it an act. I was talking to um, the woman, Ashton Applewhite, who uh, published Truly Tasteless Jokes, this huge bestseller in America in the 80s. And she says something really interesting to me, which is that, you know, you laugh at, we laugh at slapstick, um, which involves uh, someone slipping on a banana skin and splitting their head open, uh, you know, in a terrible fall. Mm -hmm. And you're laughing and your conscience might be saying, Jesus, I hope he doesn't have a concussion or he's not going to die, but you're still laughing because there's that double element to it. And a similar thing, you know, wh whether or not you laugh at the at Jimmy Carr's Roma joke, you know, there is a similar thing in all that kind of dark 
there's a reason why dark comedy is funny. It's mm-hmm. because it plays on that disjunct between your imagination and reality. And that's why people don't go around in the context of politics or the context of serious mm. things. Like if you had a day of Holocaust Memorial, you probably wouldn't tell a joke because that's a different realm. Yeah. It's a different reality. And the fact, you know, I mean, Nadine Dorries is a menace, I think. <laughs> like the fact that she's trying to scrabble out of two weeks of giving heinous interviews by, you know, trying to sell herself as the um, as a kind of woke warrior with this clamp down on <laughs> on censorship is bizarre. Clamping down on the BBC and on Netflix. Yeah, but as Tom, off everyone. <laughs> as Tom says, you know, if it's the, I think the worst thing is that if we start cheering Tory MPs or Labour MPs, anyone who start, who tries to position themselves as the kind of saviors of comedy or right thinking by using these censorious measures, then you know, I know we've said this many times, but then comedy really is dead. The other day, I started streaming this new program called Charlemagne, the Father of Europe, and you can watch or listen to it too on Wondrium. Across 12 fascinating episodes, you'll learn why Charlemagne was the most important European ruler of the early Middle Ages. The series takes you from his birth into Frankish royalty, his momentous crowning as emperor in Rome on Christmas Day in the year 800, through to his death in 814. And it was in that time that he laid the roots of what we'd now recognise as European society. I highly recommend checking out Charlemagne, the father of Europe, which is only available to stream on Wondrium. Wondrium is home to video and audio learning experiences on virtually any topic you can imagine. And it's got all kinds of formats too. You can check out documentaries, lecture series, lessons, how-to guides, and so much more. With Wondrium, you really do get both quality and quantity. And with quality like this, who needs the BBC? As well as being so engaging, all of their programmes feature presenters who really are the cream of the crop in their fields of expertise. So I know I can always trust what I learn on Wondrium. If you're curious about the world, sign up for Wondrium today. You can start by learning about Charlemagne's hugely impactful reign. Wondrium is offering listeners to the Spike podcast a special limited time offer a free 22-day trial membership. To get this offer, you need to visit wondrium.com slash spiked. Again, wondrium.com slash spiked. Sign up today. Well, let's talk about um, another incident that certainly uh, caused a great deal of hysteria in Westminster, at Mm -hmm. least. Uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, was was mobbed and heckled um, walking around in, in Westminster earlier this week. Essentially, a group of anti-vaxxers surrounded him and shouted some things about Jimmy Savile. Now, Tom, I think it's fair to say the response has been nothing short of hysterical, almost as if you know he was violently assaulted or something mm. like that. It, it was really quite extreme. It's the sort of thing where if you just read the commentary, then you would think, as you were sort of suggesting there, that he was you know like really violently attacked, properly th- physically intimidated. I mean, what I'm sure it wasn't pleasant, obviously, mm. and you know it's not nice to find yourself in that situation. But at the same time, when it when it boils down to it, it is being kind of heckled and kind of confronted verbally in public by protesters. That's essentially what it comes down to. I find it fascinating that there's so many kind of Labourites and Corbynistas even who are suggesting that this is, you know, a product of Boris Johnson continuing to kind of gin up fascistic or generally dark elements in society, quite disingenuously suggesting that you know, all this was, was Boris said that spurious comment about uh, Jimmy Savile and therefore put this idea into their heads. I mean, first of all, they, they, those protests, as you pointed out in your piece this week, were there to protest Boris Johnson. Yeah. So they're not his little foot soldiers. Uh, the other thing is they were there to protest all kinds of things that they were concerned about. Some of them legitimate, most of them not. So it's the sort of thing where you just, <laughs> it's it's such an absurd situation. But also, especially when you're talking about left-wingers, and it's this isn't just a kind of, you know, a, a dunk to say this, but you know, things like when John McDonnell would say that, you know, during the austerity years, that we should get to a position where no government minister can go anywhere without facing direct action. Mm. To then have people like that then kind of pearl clutching yeah. over people heckling mm. Keir Starmer in public is just completely ridiculous. But it is part of this general thing which flares up every once in a while, often in a very partisan way, um, depending on who the particular target is and what the particular issue is, of this idea that, again, the debate and rhetoric and the cut and thrust of politics and all the rest of it has cr- has release this poison mm. when what we saw there was something quite mundane has ha- happened you know for time immemorial just maybe it hasn't been captured and released on social media in such the same way of people shouting at politicians in the street has always happened so i just it the, the, it's so out of 
uh, out of kind of scale, if you like, the way they're reacting to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was striking in the way that some responded by referring to the killings of David Amos and Joe Cox. Mm. Mm. You know, both people killed by extremists, one by the far right, one by uh, a suspected Islamist. And this really was just a heckling. And we've had politicians be physically assaulted in the past, you know, by a, throwing an egg at, at various Labour politicians or, you know, Nigel Farage getting getting milkshaked. And that hasn't elicited this level of hysteria and, and pearl clutching. It's very strange. Even though, you know, we condemn it, obviously, but... Yeah, but I think that's the really key point. There is this suggestion that we're at this kind of fever pitch mm. for danger against politicians, that it's never been this bad mm. when you've had, you know... B- people throwing eggs, throwing drinks. Also, as it happens, a history of MPs sometimes punching back yeah. as with the famous incident with Prescott. Scott. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> quite and, legendary. And, <laughs> and, and actually, as it happens, um, not that I follow him on Twitter, but I saw him tweeting it around Christmas and it's become a kind of a meme. It's become so <laughs> acceptable. So there is a huge amount of hypocrisy going around. But I really think the use and abuse, particularly of David Amos's killing, tells you something about how degrading this discussion has become and how not based on facts it yeah. is because the idea that a uh, sort of slightly anti-vax Pierce Corbyny group shouting about um, uh, Keir Starmer being a traitor, whatever, is somehow linked to a, a alleged Islamist terrorist doing something very specific in those terms is just shows you that I think they're grasping at straws. And, you know, I, I was so thankful that you wrote that article this week, Fraser, because it you're getting to the position where you want to kind of scream at the fact that politicians now feel so entitled to not be accountable to anyone. Now, I don't particularly want to go around doorstepping politicians or shouting at them on Westminster Bridge. Um, You know, there is a thing called kind of manners in general. But if I went to a hustings or something and someone started saying something I didn't like, I'd like to be able to show my outrage. You know, there are, there are, a certain con- there's a certain context to a politician, which is that if they're in their own home doing their own thing out in a restaurant, as Nigel Farage was one time, people remember, I think he was out with his family and he got mobbed and a few people said, well, it's, it's pro- you probably shouldn't do that. But there certainly wasn't the hysteria that mm. there has been around Keir Starmer. But, you know, in general, you've got a public role. You're, Keir Starmer, you're the leader of the opposition. Um, you know, you, you're going to have to face some kind of pushback. Life isn't always going to be rosy and not everyone's going to agree with you. Mm-hmm. Where's the backbone gone from that? Um, you know, don't, Shouldn't you be celebrating the idea of a public square where people can feel like you are approachable? I mean, are we going to get to the position where British politicians start treating themselves like American ones with kind of motorcades and you never get anywhere near anyone? Um, uh, you know, I think the people who are really at fault here are not a handful of nutters outside parliament, but the politicians who are using this opportunity to, again, try and degrade the public and suggest that we're really just a danger that they have to be protected from, rather than the fact that they are supposed to be accountable to us. And we should talk about the double standards as well, because, uh, you know, David Lammy was with um, Keir Starmer when this kind of thing happened. And, you know, as we all remember back during the Brexit wars, David Lammy went on television and said that his comments comparing Tory Brexiteers to Nazis, if anything, didn't go far enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, it's one of the most dehumanizing things you can call someone. Yeah. If you're a Worse. Nazi, you're a piece of shit beneath contempt. You know? Worse than a Nazi. Worse than a Nazi, in fact, which is incredible. So to then see him and others kind of engage in this pearl clutching again about rhetoric and about how things are going really over the top and we're dehumanizing politicians, you really start to see through it because whether it's this case or whether it was the whole humbug row, you know, mm. during um, the trying to, the, the whole kind of getting Brexit through Parliament situation. Um, it only ever goes in one direction, this stuff. And it's just quite clear an attempt to just delegitimize a certain form of dissent or delegitimize certain figures. So in this case, yeah. no one, you know, the, 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 the protesters um, are really just a kind of prop for yeah. an argument as to say Boris Johnson is evil and look, he's reaping what he sows, as it were. Uh, it's just really unedifying, um, and as you say, Ella, it's just a, it's just if the only consequence of it could put, would be would be to insulate politicians further from the public, which is a really bad thing, and also it would be in response to a heckle, mm. which is ridiculous. So we talked last week uh, about Joe Rogan as our sort of lead topic. The cancellation campaign has really stepped up a notch since then. So not only are, is he being accused of spreading COVID misinformation. 
now the accusation is that he's a racist. Uh, Tom, you wrote about this this week. Uh, what do you make of it? Yeah, well, I suppose the kind of slightly glib <laughs> summary of it is they couldn't get him on COVID misinformation, so now they're just going to call him a racist <laughs> instead. Um, but they, yeah, this... It's uh, a tried and tested tried tactic. And tested like, <laughs> how long will it be until that one finds itself out? But yes, it's it's um, this was originally kind of sparked by this sort of montage of clips of him using the N-word um, mm. various times over the course of his you know, 12, 13 years, whatever it is, of podcasting. Um, as he pointed out, always quoting the word or referring to other people using it or just talking about the word itself, you know. Which again, up until quite recently, was something that, particularly in America, uh, people would do. Mm. You know, it wasn't that shocking to yeah. hear people quoting the word or whatever. Although there would occasionally be controversies about it, of course. Um, and then there was this other clip, which is far more damning, I think, but nevertheless is something that he's fulsomely apologised for, which is about twelve years ago. We kind of almost basically sort of stumbles into making like a racist joke, and then sort of pulls back from it. Um, something which again he's kind of very sincerely apologised for. He said it wasn't what he intended, but it sounds really bad, and all the rest of it. And so this is just part of the kind of ongoing campaign against him. I mean, I think the response from a lot of people, particularly a lot of his uh, people who know him, and even if you just have a sort of casual look at his work, I mean, this doesn't, he's not some sort of racist ideologue or misinformation mm -hmm. merchant. He just isn't. And yet still the fact that this campaign against him just isn't stopping, I think really demonstrates that this is so much more about the people pushing this, you know, so the corporate media who have this fury at the idea that people aren't listening to them, basically. You know, trust in mainstream American broadcast media in particular has hit an all-time low in the course of the past year. Um, and they, rather than taking that as a kind of point of reflection and wondering why don't people trust us, um, and we could all list, a, you know, cases as long as our arm in relation to why that might be the case. No, it's his fault. It's, yeah. these, it's these people's fault. It's the audience's fault for being so easily led. And so that they just have to bring him down, really, you know. And anything will do mm. is, is what it kind of feels like at this point. But it's, it says very little about him, I think, and very much about the prejudices and the um, agendas of the people going after him. Ella, I mean, the accusation of racism feels almost like it's, it's weaponized more often than it's sincere these days. It's quite shocking, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it, we've said this several times before on this podcast. It degrades the seriousness of racism, which is that if you're calling someone a racist, it's a bit like calling someone a Nazi or calling someone a paedophile. It's a very serious allegation that should be taken very seriously. It's not It's not like calling someone an idiot, or at least it shouldn't be. Mm. But it, it has become cheapened. And part of the problem with that is then if you start to cheapen the kind of boundary for what we consider to be racist, you start to, that you know, it, it leads away to people not treating racism seriously. Um, but I don't really care whether whether or not uh, Joe Rogan is or isn't a racist. I mean, I think it's quite clear that he isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I, that shouldn't matter. In, in if you look at the larger context of the fact that you mentioned in your article, Tom, you've got Jen, Jen Psaki and you know people high up in the White mm -hmm. House yeah. saying, "Well, he's apologised, but it's not quite good enough." Yeah, or, or the or the warnings were that Spotify put in were a good start. You know, yeah. <laughs> but there's more that can be done. Yeah. Stuff. First Amendment, hello, like yeah. you know what? Hang on a minute. Eve isn't the nature and the understanding of free speech that even if someone was using the N word in a way which was distasteful or racist that they should be allowed to do that on their own podcast because that's what free speech is all about. Now, I know that we don't have um, absolute free speech in a way that Spike would want it, and I know that there are many caveats to that, but we've just completely lost sight of even that kind of that principle, which yeah. is that even if you did take issue with what he said, that doesn't necessarily mean you should be allowed to censor him. And as Tom points out, you know, some of his episodes have been taken down, sort yeah. of on the quiet, mm -hmm. whether or not it's him doing it, whether or not some Spotify it's doing it. a weird selection of them as well, like one with Louis Theroux has been <laughs> I can't imagine there was <laughs> a lot noted. of, you know, racial animus yeah, in that. But anyway. God. And the, it feels like a real scream of outrage from the mainstream media in particular. There's so many journalists now who you know have had podcasts out with the New York Times or other things who can't even touch the popularity that he's mm. had. And it's just this kind of bitter jealousy, yeah. it feels like. If you can't beat him, then take him down and delegitimize him. There is a reason why people are so drawn to Joe Rogan. And that's because, to be fair to him, he has made a sell for himself out of platforming people that don't get platformed uh, elsewhere. And that is interesting to people because, uh, you know, big surprise, most of the general public have open minds and yeah. don't like yeah. to read the same stuff day in, day out with the same prejudices that a lot of mainstream media seems to have fallen into. 
you know, if only some of them would <laughs> would figure that out and maybe replicate his model with opening up their own platforms, then they might get a taste of the kind of popularity and celebrity that he's had. But I can just imagine that he's laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, it is interesting though, isn't it? Because I think that point you make about the kind of what he does and um, just these kind of very kind of open-ended conversations with people that you might agree with, disagree mm. with, some are quite extreme, some are not. Um, that kind of unguided sort of conversation on a kind of mass scale is what really terrifies them. Like if, yeah. if, if they're not, particularly if the audience is this large, if they're not getting what is effectively the approved message on the issues of the day, whether it's COVID or anything else, it just terrifies them. You know, it reminds me of um, when the New York Times wrote that piece about that Clubhouse app last year. And they, they said this was a place in which unfettered conversations were taking place. This is, this is the most terrifying thing that could ever have happened. You know, there was a, there was a, um, a AP story a few years ago talking about how podcasts were a big loophole, a big scary loophole mm. where um, social media kind of regulation happens because it's just there's just not the same level of restrictions and filters put on it. And it's just, it's so clear that, um, you know, it's like that, that, that old line about Purit Puritanism being the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. For the elite today, it's that crippling fear that someone somewhere might be thinking for themselves, yeah. not paying attention to what they're saying, uh, actually criticising them. <laughs> it is uh, this panic about misinformation. That's really what it is at, at, at the root of all of it, which is that you have all of these people, whether it's in politics or the media or anywhere else, who think ordinary people are complete idiots and yet can't understand why those people don't trust them. Yeah, That's what it seems to come down to, I think. Let's also return to the issue of the truckers uh, and Justin Trudeau and his war on the freedom convoy. This has now been going on for several weeks, but it feels as if the kind of, certainly the media war on the truckers has really heated up in the past week or so. I mean, Ella, what have you made of it? Yeah, I mean, and, and Trudeau and himself and his comments have been increasingly, we've used the word hysterical a lot on this podcast this week, <laughs> but there you go. Ha, have, it's the world we live in. <laughs> have been at the extreme level. So, but also kind of naive. So he came out and said, you know, these uh, protests are unacceptable because they're causing disruption. It's like, do you know what a protest is? You know, it's such a cliche to say <laughs> that, but of course they're disruptive. Yeah. They're intending to be disruptive. They've shut down a bridge for you know, several weeks. For God's sake, that's like, what a weird thing to say. But what he's the behind his comments of it being unacceptable and the media reporting on lots of businesses now and including businesses in the US kind of complaining about the fact that Toyota's got shortages or, you know, all this evidence that, hey, presto, the protests are working yeah. because they are shutting, showing their power by shutting down um, society to argue for their political aims, um, is couching it in this kind of immorality that it's like it's some, what they're doing is uniquely kind of amoral. They're ruining people's lives. I mean, a similar thing has happened um, over here in relation to some of the protests that have been disruptive in the UK, but the kind of fervour against them has been more marked in Canada because they are these truckers, because they are kind of like baseball cap backwards wearing yeah. guys who are like, you know, well, not they're not just guys actually, but that's the way they're kind of characterised as like Homer Simpson sort of types who carry around their jerry cans. And there's a real kind of underlying prejudice about the way in which it's been reported, you know, there's so, even in subtle ways, so many of the images that are portrayed of them are like them flipping burgers out the back of their van. And it's all, you, it has that taste of it being, you know, just these kind of ignoramus truckers who are anti-vax and they're just getting in everyone's way and throwing their weight around. When actually, if you look at it, there's a very principled nature to most of the protests. Some of it's a bit hairy, but then lots of protests have its fringe movements which is an opposition to vaccine mandates and quite sophisticated arguments around bodily autonomy from a group of people who are much maligned but are central to the functioning of a large country. Yeah. And, you know, in a different context, you would see a lot mm -hmm. of the kind of lefty progressives in Canada and internationally, you know, cheering on the comrades for standing up against, <laughs> uh, you know, big business and, and having industrial action. But no. It's also funny the way that, you know, anti-vaxxer may be an unfair fair slur against some of them. It may be fair for some of them. But it's funny how quickly all the other sort of liberal buzzwords have been mm. just reached for. So they're not only anti-vaxxers, they're also racist, transphobic, mm -hmm. Islamophobic, anti-black racist. You know, some of these use, words used by Trudeau himself. And it's been amazing to see the kind of uniformity internationally because so much of the outrage is also becoming from the US media who have compared it to mm -hmm. their... Canada's January 6th type yeah. event. 
the BBC, I was reading the BBC coverage and out of nowhere, they talked to um, a Canadian woman who said, who suddenly for some reason offers up the information that my daughter is trans and I fear for her safety. What's that got to do with mm -hmm. the, the sort of truckers thing? So there is this kind of just bizarre kind of smearing going on, mm -hmm. but we've, we're quite used to it, I suppose. It's in the Brexit playbook. It's in the Trump playbook. It's, no, no, we've seen it before. This is exactly what um, the elite and in which I include um, left wingers as well. Any form of working class people asserting themselves is fascist now. I mean, it's, yeah. in every single is instance, you have the Brexit vote, it's fascism. Hmm. You know, you've got uh, the uh, Trump revolt, this is definitely fascism. Uh, the Gilets jaunes in France, yeah. fascism. Every single time, this is just, and it, it speaks to, on the one hand, obviously, the fact, and what's been quite interesting about some of these revolts, particularly with the Gilets jaunes, a kind of parallel, I think, which is quite interesting, which you have this kind of populist uprising a little bit incoherent in places as some th some things around the fringes or whatever but its root is kind of a clear sort of anti-establishment in some cases quite principled message um but at the same time it exists completely outside of mainstream politics and yeah. also the left can't lead it doesn't know how to lead it and also doesn't want to lead it and so in those kind of accusations i think you just see a demonstration of how um, distant, the left in particular has, has, has got from any kind of form of genuine sort of um, working class power and assertion of that power. Um, because now when they see those people who they claim historically to represent taking to the streets to defend their rights, their knee-jerk reaction is, oh my God, it's Nazi Germany again. I mean, yeah. that is so telling, I think, on this, this story, but also many others before it, definitely. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.